Let's take a look at how we can create this type of effect where an object rematerializes itself inside Houdini. Let's go ahead and dive in here. We're going to rebuild this setup in a little bit different way than I normally do. I have basically just a duplicate of the final setup in here. We're going to kind of step through this node by node, but we're going to actually rebuild it as well kind of along the way, just because this is a little bit more detailed or like there's a, a little bit of a intricacies to this type of a setup that I want to make sure that we have enough time to get into. And if you want to grab the project files for this project, they're going to be available on Patreon. So head on over there if you're interested in that. But we're going to start off with a curve node and you can use any mesh that you want but we're gonna be using a curve in this example. And there are some curve specific things, but you can easily adapt the project to a regular mesh. And I may cover that in the future as well. well. Let's go ahead and wire that curve node into this ends. You can set the curve to whatever you want, but once you have that, wire it into the ends, and we're gonna set the close U to unroll with shared points. What that does is just gets rid of that polygon in the middle that we don't want. And then I'm going to wire that into a convert node. And I have done a couple things here, which is just change the level of detail on the U and the V. You can see as I raise and lower that, how that affects the mesh. Value of two gives us something that is nice and smooth for us. Let's go ahead and wire that into a fuse. Oops, into a fuse here. And that's just going to close up the the line here, just make sure that the start and the end points are, are meshed together, are one point. And this is where the graph kind of splits off into two different directions. On this side, we're going to create the fall off of the object kind of rematerializing itself together. And over here, we're actually going to create the effect itself. So we'll come back to this side in just a moment, but let's wire this into the poly wire. And once I've done that, we have a value of 0.6 for the wire radius with divisions set to 10. It gives us a nice level of detail for our mesh. Then we wanna fracture this. So we need to wire that into the fracture node as well as the scatter. We're gonna scatter 3000 points. You can raise or lower that depending on what type of points or how many points you're going for, how big of pieces you're going for. Once we have that, we can wire that into the fracture and let that calculate for just a second here. It's going to give us this mesh, which we can then evaluate what the pieces look like by wiring it into an exploded view. You can see that we get these size pieces, which is gonna be good for the situation that we have here. So let's go back to this fuse here. I'm gonna go ahead and template this. And we're, we're gonna wire this fuse into this point bob. And if I turn my point back on, you can see we have this point right here. And as I scrub along, you can see it's moving along our line, which is exactly what we want. So with this point VOP, we've just done a couple things in here. This is a pretty simple setup. So let's go ahead and just rebuild this. Do prim attribute. And that's gonna create this prim UV node. Now if you're using multiple lines and you wanna have the point kind of moving along the lines, you're gonna need to wire in this prim num as well as the op input one into the file path, but you can get away with not wiring in the prim num if you just want to collapse it all into one point like we have here. So let's wire that into our position and make sure that we have set this attribute to P. And once we've done that, you can see that we have nothing going on. There's no movement going on. And the reason for that is because we want to use the time to drive the U attribute. So the UVs of our line are gonna be from zero to one. So this time node or this time input is going to kind of be required to be inside of our frame rate. So as I go back to the first frame here, you can see that we're at the start. As I scrub along, it's going to eventually stop right back where we started. That's at frame 25, frame 24, frame 25. And the reason for that is because that is 24 frames after frame one, and our frame rate for our composition is going to be 24 frames a second. So we can change this by using this multiply constant, 
wire that into our U. And if I set this to like 0.2, you can see that we get much slower of a movement here, which is kind of what we're looking for. We don't want this to be too quick, but as we get farther along here, we get to frame 121 and it stops again. And we don't necessarily want that. Now we can change this value. I had it obviously set to 0.1 for our example, so it was gonna last for our 240 frames. But if we want this to loop, we can bring in this modulo. Let's go ahead and wire that into our setup here. And now as I go past frame 121, you can see that it just loops back over itself, which may be what you're looking for, depending on how fast you want this to go and how, uh, how long your composition is. But we'll just leave this at 0.1 and call it a day there. So once we have that, let's just wire that into a fuse just to make sure that all of those points are in one spot because if I look at this point VOP here, it looks like there's only one point here. But if I look in our spreadsheet, it's collapsing all of the points into one position. So with that fuse, we just collapse those all into one point. And then we want to wire this into a copy to points. And now we have a sphere that's gonna move along our line. And the reason that we wanna do that is because we want to actually use that in a group node. But before we do that, we need to take the output of our fuse here and wire that into a resample to make sure we have a nice smooth line. I've set that length to 0.08 and then we want to fuse those together just to make sure that we have the closed ends and everything. And then we'll wire that into a group node with the bounding object set. Also group type set to points. It's important that you specify this. Sometimes it doesn't grab the right thing. So as we move along in our timeline, you can see that the group is now moving along our, our object here, which is what we're looking for. So. Let's go ahead at this point and we're going to untemplate this fuse. I'm also going to turn off our point. And we're going to set a color here because we're going to use the group here to drive a mask. So we're going to set the color to black and then we're going to set the group one to be white. And the reason, like I said, is because we're going to be using this as a mask. So we'll wire this into an attribute blur with blurring iterations set to 1000. This is now just kind of a grayish color. So we want to adjust that. We can do that using an attribute adjust color. I've set the attribute name to CD with the remap attribute with this color ramp. And then I've also enabled color correction and just pumped up the gamma here, which gives us this. You can see on and off. You can play with these values to get different looks to the fall off. And then lastly, I'm pumping this into a point VOP. And what this point VOP is going to be doing, if I dive in here, it's going to be multiplying and then clamping our color. And I'm multiplying by this number that I've promoted just to make sure that it is going above one so that we can then clamp it so that these pure white values are going to be a value of one and we're going to have values of zero as well. We're handling it from zero to one because we want the fall off to go from zero or all the way where we started or where we're going to start with the points to where we're going to end up with the points, which is going to be back in their original positions here. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, it should make sense here in just a moment. So let's go ahead and wire this Voronoi fracture into this extract centroid because I want to get these starting positions or I should say the ending positions of the points here. So we can wire this into a ray with the poly wire. Whoops, the poly wire. If it wants to stop calculating, there we go. Poly wire set to ray with minimum distance because we want to place these back onto the surface of our poly wire. The reason for that is because here in just a moment, we're going to calculate the direction we want to displace these points from by using the extracted points centroid right here. And we're going to move them in the direction of the surface of the poly wire. 
So like I said, we'll cover that here in just a moment here. We're going to wire in our extracted centroids into this attribute transfer, and we're going to wire in the result of this point VOP so that we can get the color from our what we created over here. So this color onto our points. We're transferring CD points to points. And the reason for that, like I said, is because we're going to be using this as a mask to affect a couple of different things. So we're going to wire this now into this attribute wrangle. And we're also going to wire the second input of our wrangle into the ray. So like I said just a second ago, with this attribute wrangle, we're going to be setting the normal equal to, we're getting the normal, or sorry, the position of the points from this, so this point position. And then we're going to subtract the point position of this. And the reason that we do that is if I turn on our normals here, and you can normalize this if you want. If I zoom way in here, you can see that we have our normals now pointing in the direction of the surface of our polywire. It must be in this order in order for that to, to do so. Like I said, you can normalize that if you want, but it doesn't really matter for this setup, so I'm not going to worry about it. Once we've done that, we can wire this into a point VOP. And in this point VOP, all I have done is set a displace along normal with this displacement amount. So not too much, but just a little bit of displacement here. And you can see if I turn this off and on again, you can see what that does to our point positions. So once we have that set up, we want to just jitter that position a little bit. So we want to randomize the position, set it to a low value, just change the seed, whatever you want. And then we were going to wire this into an attribute randomize with the orient attribute setup. And this is gonna create an orient attribute. Basically, it's going to randomize the rotation of our points because we want to have a little bit of randomness to that and kind of have them rotate into place. And then we actually don't need this, so I'm just gonna skip this P scale. It's not something that I used in the final result here. But we wanna wire in the attribute randomize orient into the first input of the attribute wrangle. And then we also wanna get the extracted centroid and wire that into the second input here. And I'll show you why here in just a moment. So what we're doing in this attribute wrangle is a few different things. With the first line here, we have the vector. We're getting basically creating a uh, vector that we are going to store the initial position of our points. So that's going to be where they're going to start out. So these extracted centroid or rather where they're going to end up. And then we're going to create an initial orient attribute as well that we're going to set to the orientation from those points as well because we want the points to end up in their original places and we also want them to end up with their original rotations. And that all makes sense here in just a moment. I'm going to skip this section of code for just a moment because it's kind of easier to visualize once you have the final setup in place here. So we're going to go into this transform to pieces. We're going to take our Veroni fracture. We're going to wire that into the first input. We're going to wire this attribute wrangle into our second input. And you can see if we do that, we get this kind of uh, stretched out almost like it's an exploded view. So they're not quite in the right places and that's because we have to set the rest positions to this extracted centroid. And once we've done that, you can see that our points are now into the final positions. And this is actually the final effect. So this moves along here all the way that we want. And I am actually converting or copying over the color as well because I'm gonna use that in shading to drive some different values, but we'll, you can take a look at that if you grab the project files. Let's come back to this attribute wrangle here for a second, and let's take a look at what some of this does. So if I go ahead and just delete out this position lerp, you're gonna see what we get here. So they're just staying in that position that they were uh, kind of jittered into, which is not what we want. So what are we doing with this lerp? We're taking the position that we created here, so these positions, 
we're going to set that equal to the LERP, so the linear interpolation of our first input, so our position uh, that they're currently in, so the, these positions. And then we're going to take the initial position, so the positions that we had in the extract of the centroid, which I actually probably should have called final position, but the final position that they're going to end up, and then we're going to LERP that or linearly interpolate based on the CD, so the color. So a value of white is going to be one, or it's going to be completely set to this position from the extracted centroid, and a black value will be zero, or the fully jittered position that we create, the randomized position. And that's kind of the same thing for the orient as well. So if I just, let's actually view this. If I get rid of this line of code now, you can see that we have this random orientation and it's not re-materializing re into the final positions or the positions that we started with because it doesn't have that uh, orient attribute to look at. So we're setting the orient equal to the linear interpolation of the random orientation that we created as the first value. And then we're going to interpolate between that and the final value or these values right here based on the color. And then the P scale, we're doing the same thing, but we're setting the P scale equal to the linear interpolation of zero to one based on the red channel of our color. The reason we're not using CD is because this is uh, going between a, or this is a, a float. It's not a vector, so it's going to need a float in order to work properly. And a black and white color is just black and white in every, every channel. So we can just use the red channel or the blue channel or the green channel, whichever one that you see fit. But this is the, the final setup. We can just wire in a normal, just make sure our normals are correct. Match size will allow us to reset that to the right position or to the position that we wanted for our final animation. And we're good. So a little bit of some, some intricacies in here, but this is kind of based, or this is kind of how you would set up a, a fall off inside Houdini. You can use mops, it's probably a whole lot easier, but I just like to create them from scratch sometimes just cause uh, it's kind of fun to kind of think your way through it and figure out how it works. It's also good practice. Gets you using some nodes that you don't necessarily use all the time and uh, you don't have to rely on outside tools if you don't want to. But anyways, hopefully this helps you out. This is kind of a, an interesting little setup, an interesting way to create a fall off inside of Houdini and gets you used to some VEX with some easy linear, linear interpolation in this whole transform pieces note if you've never used that before. But like I said, hopefully this helped you out and you found it interesting. I do make a bunch of other videos on Houdini, so if you want to learn more about Houdini, make sure you check those videos out. I also covered some stuff on Redshift, so if you're interested in that, go ahead and check those videos out as well. But anyways, thank you guys for watching and have a good day. Thank you.